go. All righty. Thanks everybody for joining. Uh, Donna, I know you've been able to meet with us a, on a few others. Claudia, I, I'm not sure if you have or not. I'll just quickly say if you're not familiar with Eastern Sierra Land Trust, we are a nonprofit 50501C. 501 Can I not remember? 501C3. There we go. Um, boy, that was a tongue twister and it shouldn't have been. And uh, we're based in Bishop and we work with private landowners to protect their land, uh, both for uh, migration corridors, habitat, as well as working lands. We also have the Community Connections Program, which Gabrielle is our education coordinator and AmeriCorps member. She runs this entire program and she is um, through AmeriCorps serves an 11 month service term. So she is pretty much donating her time for 11 months for the purpose of building her resume, building her skill set, and we get to work together. And it's just, it's fantastic. And she's here with us through about the third week in September. So just um, a little bit of Zoom etiquette. There's only a few of us. So I think if you want, you can un, un um, Unmute yourself. Hi, Claudia. I can see you've got something. You live in Los Angeles, but really one of, oh yes, it is amazing, the Bristol Cone Forest. I hope you can get up here. It's, it's just spectacular. So um, I think I'll just kick it off. There's a, I, what I was saying, there's a few of us. You can put questions in the chat. I'll be monitoring, monitoring it. So will Gabrielle. And um, with so few people, I think if you just raise your hand, we can probably talk. I think Roberta, on the last one, you preferred questions to be held until the end. Is that the same? Um, no, I think we can be a little bit more interactive today. Okay. And actually Great. have a part where people can participate right away. Ooh, fantastic. Then I'm gonna turn it over to Gabrielle to um, take the next steps. Yeah, um, well, first I just want to say thank you for, for joining us. Um, it's a beautiful day outside, so we appreciate you being here and hopefully you can get some sunshine as well. Um, but um, I know that Donna has already heard the spiel of the Eastern or the East Side Pollinator Garden Project. Um, but for um, just to say it again quickly, um, it's essentially why we do the Growing Together workshop series uh, to bring in community members and um, help help share their knowledge and gather support um, so we can grow together as gardeners and a community. Um, so we have recorded stuff on drip irrigation, on soil rest restoration, uh, native plants. So uh, all kinds of good education there. And what the Eastside Pollinator Garden Project is essentially um, is a program that we help certify your gardens or outdoor spaces as pollinator friendly. So last week, uh, Pete made the really good point of a lot of species need these stepping stones um, in order to find shelter, food or water. And we can make um, those stepping stones from our yard by creating a pollinator friendly yard um, or pollinator friendly habitat essentially so what this entails is I will come to your your outdoor space that you want to certify um, check it out go over criterion visions I will come a couple weeks later or however when you're ready um, to see how you've met that criteria and then once that once you've met that I will give you a voucher for the August fall native plant sale with California Native Plant Society. And then lastly, the visit is the, uh, the grand unveiling and I give you a official sign that um, says you're certified and shows your neighbors that you're certified. And um, yeah, so if you're interested, please contact me. It's gabrielle at eslt.org. Um, and I can put that in the chat as well. Um, and yeah, and then all that being said, I just want to thank all the members that help us with this project. So Metabolic um, Studios funds this project. We have California Native Plant Society. It's a huge help. Um, Inyo and Mono Master Gardeners. 
which Roberta is a um, member of. So thank you. And also, of course, all of you and yeah, all of our participants. And yeah, so I'll give the floor to Roberta. Um, she's going to talk to us today about garden design and just just to set the set the stage her garden is incredibly designed like just so creative and a couple months ago I was like Roberta you have to do a talk on design and creativity and art so um, that's what she is excited to share with us today so yeah I'll let you take the take the mic Roberta mm -hmm. What do you want me to do? I just start talking, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, if you have a, a screen to share or slideshow pictures, yeah. go for it. Okay. So welcome to our class. And it's fun to have someone from a different climate zone because some of the things I'm going to talk about, I don't think we can do in Bishop, but Claudia, you could do that in Los Angeles. So that'll be fun. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. I have a little PowerPoint with a lot of pictures. So hopefully that will be good. Let's see. I should shut my email. Oh, well, we'll deal with that. OK. OK, so we're going to talk about creativity and oops, what did I do wrong? We're going to talk about creativity and design in your garden. And so the premise of this talk is that anyone can create an artistic, beautiful, and provocative garden that fits the needs of the family, is functional, and is pleasing to the eye. And I hope that I'm able to give you the confidence to take your garden to the next level. Um, when we moved into our house, we have an acre. So the back half of the property was all of this tumbleweed stuff that we had to hire a neighbor. And now you can see a sitting area that's almost in the exact spot where all that tumbleweed was. Um, not a lot of garden there, but a sitting area. So you have to figure out how you, how to know what you want in your garden. You know, what do you want it to look like? And to do this, you need to practice your seeing skill. So, and that means you need to become truly aware of what's around you. And it can be in a beautiful place or a little side alley or parking lot or the bank, garden area, it doesn't matter where you are. You just need to develop your eye and keep looking carefully at things around you. You need to hone in on things you love in terms of nature, color, styles, form, and feelings. You need to be open to your surroundings. You need to be willing to break the rules and you need to be willing to go beyond convention. Um, and you need to practice. And I particularly like this picture because it's all these little old fashioned sewing machines and I'm a sewer and I don't know, it's a lot of repetition and stuff. And to me, this is something you could emulate in your garden. So I'm gonna show you a bunch of slides that I find interesting, some of which I've stolen design ideas from for my garden or might use sometime in the future or might suggest to someone when I do a master gardener consult. And feel free to chime in if you see something in particular you like about the slide I'm going to show you. This is a house in Apple Valley around the corner from my mom's house. And when my dad was sick, I'd walk down the street and I really like this garden. So one day I surreptitiously took pictures. I think what I like about it, it has different leaf structures. It has the iris over here and some kind of grass and like little snow in summers maybe. It has this wall that you could use for seating an olive tree, this um, boxwood against one of the walls and this nice broken um, pavement, flagstones and some big rocks back here. And it has this curvy winding path 
And I think actually this is the neighbor's house. I think their property ends here, but it looks like it goes to the neighbor's house, which you know extends your property line in terms of your view. So this is a house I thought, I'm sure this is professionally landscaped, but it's really pretty, I think. This is um, an old ranch in Mono County. And what I liked about this is rather than um, square off on the corner, they did this nice rotating arc, kind of a pain to build, but you know, it's beautiful. And that might be an idea you might steal someplace in your garden. And this is another house in Apple Valley. Um, a lot of people take out their lawns because they charge them an arm and a leg for water and they made a dry stream bed. But what I really liked was this pile of rocks to sort of suggest a waterfall, even though there's absolutely no water in this landscape. And this is a garden in Reno on, what's that street called? The art, okay. And this is just a beautiful scene. Um, some people in Bishop have the ability to uh, divert the drainage canals into their yard and you could do something like this. It's sort of Asian-y feeling, but it's quite pretty. It has a little island in the middle. This is a cabinet at a house. I did a master gardener consult. And what I liked is the metal top and the different kinds of wood to make sort of a design. And this is a bunch of tools at um, a train yard. And I, I like, you know, as you'll see, I like old rusty things. Um, and I just thought if you go to a yard sale and you see a bunch of wrenches, you hang them up on a wall and you have instant art. Now these are tools that they use at this train yard, but it's still art. This is um, the Ruth Bancroft Botanical Gardens. And I just liked how they use decomposed gravel for a path, the different sizes of rocks makes it look more natural and it's curvy. So you, you get a sense of adventure as you walk down. So when you're making paths, that's just something to think about if you have the room. And this is just snow that happened, I just like the orderliness of this design. And here's a window box with a multi-frame window. Modern windows, you know, are big panes of glass. And if you add little mullions, you get something more cute. And again, rocks. This is the garden at Renown. They have a labyrinth. I have a labyrinth. Um, they have a pond and different plantings, and most of these are California, Nevada natives. So it's a nice place to get an example of what you can do. And they've made little tucked away seating areas on these little paths. Um, this is from the Los Angeles Botanical Garden. They were doing an Asian, um, I forget what this was called. I didn't write it down, but little Asian arrangements and I thought that was quite pretty and you could do something like this in a corner of your yard or on your patio and again another stream bed I think this is from Palm Springs and what's important to note to make a stream bed look more realistic which is why I took this picture is the middle part where the water would run is dug out so it's a little lower than ground level and it usually has smaller rocks with some different sizes in there and on the edges are the bigger rocks. And there's really like three sizes of rocks here and then the grade change. So just something to remember. And again, it's a little curvy. Water doesn't run straight unless it's concreted in like the Los Angeles River. Um, this is an example of an altar. This is the Buddhist temple in Victorville. Um, and it's an example of symmetry. Um, this was during the Tet Festival, so it's highly decorated with fruit and flowers, I think more so than usual, but perhaps not, but it's quite beautiful. Um, and this is a quilt of an old um, post office, and I like the fretwork. I like this straight um, shade cover, I think over the front door, and I like these little brackets under the roof. 
things you might want to incorporate on your shed or on your house. And this is just a big old warehouse in Palm Springs that I like these long windows. And I did emulate that in our backyard on our woodshed. And this is, I'm not sure what this is. It's, it was in a backyard in a house in Reno where they had an art show. I think it's the old well or pump house, but I thought the design of this was quite interesting. So if you have the time and the wherewithal, rather than make a straight angular shed or tool closet, you could make something a little bit more arty farty like this. And this is um, a back street in Gardnerville. And it's, I mean, these are all plants that we grow here. And it's the purple, uh, Russian sage, barberry. And I think that's a Wiglia, I'm not sure. But the three colors, just like, do you like how they look together? Maybe yes, maybe no. Kind of a weird color combination. And again, another stream from Apple Valley, same thing, the middle's dug out, different size rocks, grasses, um, much less, much more simple than the first one I showed you, but it's still very effective. And this is a fence at the Bancroft Gardens um, with these little shells, um, which I thought, you know, you could easily add these to an existing fence and then put things on it like plants or rocks or treasures. And this is the pipes at Brown's um, at the Y. I just like it. And this is um, Aboriginal art at the museum in Reno. And I just like these beads, the rings, and the rope tied around. And those are things you could incorporate into your yard somewhere. And another fence at Bancroft Gardens. So you can get inspiration from anything, as you can see. It could be something that you see, hear, smell, touch, or taste. It can be a song, a person, a story, a place. It can be a dream from a dream or an imaginary place. It could be anything as long as it pleases you. And inspiration conveys something important about who you are and what you like. And Phyllis Schaefer is an artist from South Lake Tahoe. And I don't know if people are familiar with her work, but there's a picture of it. And her colors are very accurate to the Eastern Sierra, but then she does these swirly skies and the things are kind of fish-eyed and everything. And her suggestion in her art class is to capture kernels of ideas and inspiration, no matter how small. So when we were looking at that collection of pictures, maybe the only thing you liked in that altar scene were the vases of flowers that were next to that Buddha. And that's the only thing that really excites you about that picture, but that's an idea you wanna keep in your brain and try to incorporate down the road. So your brain, this is science here, little science. We hold on to these images and experiences that move us. And if they seem disparate, they'll often form a cohesive picture when taken together inspiration strikes when you least expect it. And you should always be snapping photos, jotting down notes or sketch. And if you have time then, or when you get home, write down why you like it. Um, because that will solidify in your brain and it will come out in ways that will really surprise you down the road in your garden and in your inside of your house as well. The light bulb going off over your head is when you incorporate all these ideas into your yard and you get something that really pleases you. So places for ideas outside. When you're out and about on a trip, um, I like this because I like the strings of lights, you know, which is very Italian, outside restaurant-y, whatever. I also like this um, metal, I don't even know what it is, shade structure. This is a winery south of Sacramento. And this is a terrible picture and I'm sorry, but we incorporated the lights into our patio. You can take a walk rather than drive down a familiar street. When I go into town to Bishop, 
I always go 10 or 15 minutes early for my appointment and I walk one of those cute little streets in downtown Bishop and look at people's houses. I don't usually take pictures in Bishop because I might know the people, but um, this is in um, the gold country and I like this little cover and the batting style and the wood and the sink thing. I think the latter is utilitarian, but Here's my shed from Stockton that we dolled up and here's um, a shed from a garden center in Carson City. And then you can look deeply into a scene and there might be only one part that interests you. So this was a plane that did touch and goes um, out of Bishop, I think two summers ago. And I think what I really like on this for me is the spikes that are on top of this plane. And I forget what they do, but they're very important to the plane. It might be radar, but I just really like those spikes against Mount Tom. And here we found some aluminum twisty poles at the salvage yard and I stuck them in my garden um, to add height. But to me, they remind me of those spikes on that plane. And so that's an interpretation of those plain spikes. Commercial areas can be a source of inspiration. They often hire professionals. They're probably subject to landscaping rules and strict watering rules, particularly in Southern California. This is the garden at the In-N-Out Burger in Loma Linda on Tippecanoe Avenue. And it's very beautiful and I mean, we can't grow these palm trees here in Bishop, but um, you can in Southern California, but we can grow, I mean, we definitely have these. And here's again, as you can tell, I like stream beds. And here's a very fancy landscaped house in Palm Springs, you know, a very modern, almost stark interpretation of a stream bed that I thought was quite pretty. Um, and then yard sales. Pete and I were yard selling and this woman had done this. I think this is just straight dirt and I think it's part of her driveway. And she, I asked her if I could take a picture because again, the different size rocks and a few plants in there. I thought it was quite artistic, particularly for a little space. It was only like two feet wide and 10 feet long. Um, and here's our interpretation of it. And this is um, a little dugout stream we made and it gets water from the downspouts off our roof. So we haven't had water in like in that in a few years, but it's still pretty when it happens. You can get ideas from magazines, websites, Pinterest, etc. These are some of my folders because I've been doing this since before computers and I'm not quite sure how I would keep all that on the computer at this point. Um, you can also keep color swatch, swatches of favorite colors, textures, materials, things like that. Um, so here's a couple of pages I ripped out. I thought this was very interesting. It's sort of a gabion with lights in it. And here's a flagstone path. You can use books for inspiration. Um, the good thing about books is they usually tell you how to do the thing you're looking at that you like. Um, so here's a book that's talking about materials, how to use them. This is from an old Sunset Magazine and these people had a pool and it was a really but ugly 1950s pool and they naturalized it and planted around it and made this cooling thing for their house. Um, it's a very interesting article. Um, if I ever have a pool, I would pull this article out and try to implement these ideas. You should start collecting things that you like if you haven't already started that. You can gather things around your house that maybe aren't in the best place. You can use things from inside your house. You can group like things together to make a collection. A collection would be color, type, objects, what it's made out of, a theme. <laughs> It's whatever you deem to be a collection. And a collection is anything three or more. Yard sales and flea markets, you can often buy several things at once. So we went to a ranch yard sale, I think last weekend, two weeks ago. 
And this is what I gathered actually out of the trash pile on the property, but I have all these little log cabin syrup things and I have um, tool handles. And I think this is a wine holder that to me looks like a, a set of grasses. Um, and then we have an outdoor tree yeah. lamp. And uh, so here's all my little log cabin syrup things making a village. And try to use trash or recycle objects that might end up in a landfill. For example, broken concrete makes a good stone substitute for paths or retraining walls. Um, and often it's quite beautiful because it has stone in it. Old saw blades, pots, et cetera, can make edging or patio tiles. Mirrors can be framed and mounted on a wall or fence to add garden depth. You can go to the dump, you can go to Brown salvage yard, yard sales, um, wherever people are trying to recycle things in your community. And it keeps things out of the landfill and it's free. So in Stockton, we had many wine barrels to put plants in, but they eventually rot and you're left with the, the metal rounds that hold them together. So we, um, we moved around and ended up making these after we saw a picture. And you can buy these for like $100, but it was trash that we kept and moved at the moving van when we moved here. Um, so interpretations. So this is a page out of a magazine with the, um, the bent rebar or metal rods. And this is my interpretation. These are already bent, got them from Browns, and it's a similar look. Um, window frames. I'm partial to window frames. So here's a lady who made like a freestanding pergola patio thing with her window frames. And this is my interpretation of window frames. This is, we have a covered deck and it was open, so we fitted the window frames in to give a sense of enclosure and intimacy. Man-made streams, so here's my gutter thing again, but this is someone's house with actual running water. This is in Palm Springs. This is mosaic tile laid into a concrete pathway, and this is our interpretation of that. I like corrugated metal. I, I clearly live in the right place because I like all this Western rustic stuff. Um, but this is our woodshed. We just put some corrugated metal around it to try to fireproof it. And here's one of those long uh, narrow windows like in that gymnasium picture I showed you. Um, so there's an interpretation there. And I like the old Forest Service rustic buildings with the stone. So we put stone against our house and this is our septic tank cover and we put stone and metal around on top of that and around it. If you get stuck with inspiration or design wise, just try repetition. Repetition is a very um, successful design element. So here we have all the little blue bottles and a big one there, here we have sticks. These are saw blades against the barn at the Honeywell Ranch. These are shovel heads and pitchforks that I've been collecting at yard sales and junk sales. And this is um, Inspiration Point at Zephyr Cove Presbyterian Church. And I'm sure these have a religious meeting, um, but I just like the repetition. And plus you have the two pine trees after that. And I think that's very effective and it blocks the view, but hardly at all. So it's successful in its religious meaning and its landscaping meaning. I mean, it works for both things. I like to repeat elements. I like springs. So I have springs on top of stakes. This is a, a bed, a child's bed spring that we hung from the deck and put Christmas lights in. Um, to make like a chandelier. This is a big spring we hung in a big open deck that we have that again gives you a sense of enclosure. Um, and then we have some big springs that we made stacked rocks like you might find in hiking. There's repetition of plants. So Rebecca's, Columbines, 
And here we have white, yellow, white, yellow, another form of repetition. So any questions at this point or shall we keep going? Okay, so next steps. You wanna analyze, you make all, you take all these pictures, rip things out of magazines, markup books. You wanna take some time to analyze why you like them. Ask yourself, is this the color, materials, feeling it gives you, shape, location, proportion, or something else? And you may not be able to figure that out right away. It takes some practice. And look at everything you've marked. Are they similar? Do they reflect things you already have in your house or yard? Or are they different? What do they remind you of? Um, and do they suggest a style? Modern, rustic, cottage, Victorian, Zen, I don't know, sky's the limit. But if they su suggest a style, then that helps you on your journey. There's other ways to get design inspiration if what we've talked about so far doesn't work. You could try to emulate a place. And to emulate a place, you wanna look for cultural elements to give you a sense of place. And that might be colors of a place. Um, like in Greece, the whitewashed uh, buildings, the blue sea, you know, that, you know, for a lot of people that says Greece. And if you wanted your yard to look like Greece, you would want to consider, you know, painting some of your, your outbuildings white or maybe the back of your house white to make it look like Greece. Plant and leaf shape of the place. So I'm not sure what beach this is, but it's clearly palm trees. And so for our Southern California watcher, this is what you can do, you know, banana plants, palm trees, uh, tropical plants would suggest Hawaii or Tahiti or uh, Vietnam. Um, so uh, we can't do quite as much of that up here because of our weather, but it is doable to some extent. Um, emulate the texture of a place. This is, um, uh, maybe Descanso Gardens or I'm not sure, one of the botanical gardens in Southern California. This is uh, one of their Japanese gardens and they have the big rocks, the rake sand, minimal planting, very austere decking, but it says Asian Zen, relaxing, meditation, that kind of thing. Um, emulate a place with using items that make a space more authentic. Again, this is Honeywell Ranch, and these are old wheels and things they have piled up against the barn. And to me, that says Western rustic. Um, and I mean, I'm always looking for things like this for my house. Or you can use plants that have a scent of place. So this is clearly the south of France with the lavender, which we can grow lavender in Bishop. So someone could do that here. If they like France or Italy, they can grow this lavender. Um, other ways to gain inspiration is consider your hobbies. Your hobbies might suggest as a design element of inspiration, or you could use items from your hobbies, a garden decoration or design. For example, a needle, needle pointer might make a patio with a painted design on it or use different colored pavers. A fisher might make a pond with or without water with fish. Um, we have metal fish in our streams and ponds or, or use a similar plant palette. And again, when we were in Loma Linda, we were taking a walk and here is a driveway. Um, and this is clearly a quilt pattern. I don't remember what quilt pattern, but this is definitely a quilt. Um, so here's an example of, I don't know if these people were quilters, but if you were a quilter, you could do something like this in your house or your yard. Um, consider a garden room. Each garden room has its own use and its own style and feeling. And you can do this even if you have a small garden or a big garden. It breaks the garden into smaller spaces that are easier to deal with. Each room connects to each other via a lawn, a path, or some other means. It's nice to have a little mystery. So again, curves and plants or structures to hide it a little bit while you're approaching it is helpful. We, at my house, we like to name our rooms and 
each area in this garden is our own room. So what we're looking at is the beach and you'll see the beach a little bit later. Um, it's nice to make sitting areas in your garden, even if it's only for one person. And clearly in this magazine picture, that's a very secluded sitting area and might be hidden from the rest of the garden. Um, and think about unexpected places in your yard, uh, maybe places you wouldn't even think about landscaping, uh, but they might make a good, quiet, contemplative place. Might be a nice place for your kids to go to when they wanna get away from you or their brothers and sisters. Um, you know, it's a nice little secret hidden area that a lot of times you can fit into your yard. Um, and don't forget side yards, driveways in the front yard. Um, again, these are smaller spaces, easier to landscape and decorate. Uh, small areas can often be more pleasing and intimate than a large area. It gives the family another area to go to. Um, probably during the pandemic, that would be really important. Um, and sometimes these side spaces have good wind and temperature protection. And you can also incorporate utility areas if needed. And so this, so this is an article from Sunset and this yard is in the Bay Area. It's only 24 feet wide and it's on a hill. So they have, you know, some different challenges, although I think that's an advantage, but they just made different areas to sit in. And this is another really, I think this is a 15 foot wide garden, again on a hill, but they did things like they made some steps, they used different paving textures, they oriented some of the paving on a diagonal, I think it's on a diagonal up here, they put a water feature in, they oriented the seating in different areas and they did some cutouts for planting. And it's very um, complicated in a, in a pleasing design sort of way, as opposed to just a straight level of paving and some steps. So again, add, you know, take triangles out of your areas, do some planning. Planning always softens hardscape and looks nice. And this is our, um, this is our winter patio. And this is a, this is a utility shed that came with the house. We built this shade thing um, more to shade the house, which is over here. Um, but this is wide enough for a big camper and it's paved. I think it was supposed to be RV parking and we've made it into a nice sitting area. And um, this is where we sat with Kay when she was thinking about taking the job she has right now. And we had a lovely little time and it was April and it was cold outside, but this had a lot of sun and wind protection. And it was quite a lovely uh, middle of the day uh, get together. Um, if you have utility sheds and they can be those Rubbermaid things that aren't very big or one of those big metal sheds, try to make them pretty. These people did a little seating area in front. They added some metal that they cut with these scallops. They did some fanciful painting. They put a a million window over the regular window and a planter box, put some plants and geese, I think here. Um, and it's quite a cute little shed. And this is um, at the Casbah Ranch. So this is totally what it looks like. It's, but they have little curtains, uh, they put a chair and there's actually a bathtub in there. That's really cool. Um, Practical principles. Your space should accommodate your life, not the other way around. You should be comfortable, should be functional. You want to create a space that will be lived in, and you want to create a destination space that people want to go to and stay in. So things to think about. How and where would you like to live, work, play in the space? Will it be used as entertaining, to cook, lounging, music, TV, making crafts, growing food, or and if you have kids, I think about the kids, day-to-day -day use, yoga, meditation, baseball, pitching. We have two neighbors that have pitching cages in their yard, which are quite big. And my one neighbor, her kid is graduating high school and she's thinking of converting it into a chicken run. So 
um, you know, but it takes up a huge piece of real estate in her yard right now. And if you have pets, do they need to be enclosed or not? What are you gonna do about their waste, food and water? Um, there's a lot of yards that do dog runs along a side or a back fence, but they landscape it nicely. And if there's a dog house, they make the dog house look cute. And so it works in the overall scheme of design. And then do you have practical issues like storage, tools, toys? Do you need shade or wind protection? Do you need to block out a view? Do you need to do noise control? Noise control often is a big fountain running a lot of water. That's usually very effective. Um, and then think about will spaces change in the future? Like the place where your kid has got their backstop for kicking the soccer ball that needs a little bit of lawn. Think about what you might do with that when your kid is no longer playing soccer. You might want to have a patio there. Maybe that's the best place for your vegetable garden because it gets a lot of nice sun. You know, just keep that in the back of your head as you're planning. Um, so then you need to assess your garden, take some measurements. Um, and this is more so you know how much materials you need to buy. Note plants you want to keep, where your water spigots are, sprinklers, drip, etc. And this is sort of a little note when we were making the beach, we wanted to keep those pine trees, wanted to limb them up. We had vines that needed to be trim, trimmed. There was brick edging we needed to pull up. I had a rain bird like right in the middle of that that we converted to drip. And we wanted a fire pit with chairs and benches. And I had an enamelware collection of bowls that was just sitting in the garage in a box. It's like, oh, I could put those out there. Um, you need to note sun and shade areas, wind directions, and any slope or drainage issues so you can address those. Assess your soil type. You can go to the Master Gardener's uh, website here um, to find out how to do a soil test and you can get a map to see what kind of soil you have. And I'm sure in Southern California, there's something similar that you can access. Um, look at existing such as driveways, fences, or rocks, anything you might want to keep. Um, and then can you steal from the neighbors, uh, their trees, fences, etc., or do you want to shield them from view? This is my neighbor's deodore tree that all the big birds in the neighborhood like to perch on. And it's, you know, kind of far from our property line, but it fits in and we like to think it's part of our property. Do you have any microclimates, you know, really hot areas, really cold areas, those kind of things? Because I'll go back to this in a minute. Microclimates uh, means you can plant different plants. Um, you might be able to plant a plant outside of your planting zone, um, depending on the microclimate. And then a rough sketch. This was my sketch of the beach area, sort of reminding me of things, because as you get busy, you forget, like you might forget you wanted to hang the enamel wear on the fence. And, you know, it, it lets us figure out where the water was, where we're gonna put the brick and so forth. And it can be totally rough. And these sketches are sort of fun to do because when you're done with the project, you can go back and look at your sketch and see how close you came or not, or how you reinterpreted your original sketch. Think about whether you wanna emulate your location here, Western dry high desert, or do you wanna be in a completely different space? Um, I would love to do a tropical garden, but I just don't think I can figure out the plant palette here. If I was in Southern California or the Bay Area, I could definitely do that. Um, plant issues. Are there allergies? I did one master gardener consult where someone was allergic to bees, so we really couldn't plant a lot of flowers um, close to the sitting areas in the house. I went to another house where she wanted to make flower arrangements. So we wanted flowering plants. Do you need to deal with defensible space? Cactus, if you have grandchildren or little kids, um, probably even big kids, uh, maybe you don't wanna be planting cactus close to where they play. How much maintenance do you wanna do? 
And if you have a pool or really strange weather, do you want um, your plants to be hardy to that? There's a whole list of plants that are chlorine pool tolerant um, if you need that. Um, I think here we probably don't, but some people might. Hardscape issues. Do you need shade, pass, a dog washing station, an outdoor shower? I still haven't gotten my outdoor shower, but I'm closer. Do you need walls and fences, a clothesline, or security issues? Um, this is employee housing at Yosemite. <coughs> Excuse me. And I just love that laundry and that fence. So planning. Hardscape, water, and electrical are best done first because of the labor. It's easier to lay an electrical line before you put the pavers down for the patio, for example. They're the most expensive, but once they're done, smooth sailing after that. And if you, if you have a plan that wants to have bigger trees or other plants, try to plant those at the same time you're doing the hardscape because it'll take a while that to finish the first steps and it'll give that plant a longer time to grow. And hopefully by the time you're done, well, it won't be where you want it to be, but it'll be closer and in a couple of years, you know, you'll have that one or two year head start for that big shade tree. Um, you can start working on the rest of the plan as you go, prioritizing. And remember, it doesn't have to be done all at once. A shade cloth could be used for a few years until you have the time and money to finish building the arbor. You can use that ugly lawn furniture till you have time to get that beautiful set that you've been eyeing at Crate and Barrel or, or that you're gonna make. Um, so this is our beach area. So this is what we started with. Here's the three pine trees and here's a plum tree. And this was all grass and then we the pine trees grew big and we put gravel over, we took out the grass and put gravel. And then this is how we finally finished it this year. So this is like, I'm retired. And so this is, garden is my hobby. So we're not in a big rush necessarily, but we limbed up the trees for fire. I hung my enamel wear on and we trimmed the vines a little bit. And now we have this really nice area and we had the chairs, the fire pit, Pete built the bench a few years ago, and it's a much more useful and inviting area. Um, and then details, um, this little blue glass here, this face here, little surprises that people find in your yard is what really puts it over the top. And it can be anything that appeals to you and you love. So I pulled this picture out of a magazine and I just think it's really inviting and appealing. And I thought we could go through some of the elements that make it because it's, it's a shade structure. I think it's freestanding, but I'm not sure. This might be the side of the house and a couple chairs and a table. I mean, and you could do that. That's where you would start, but they added a little birdhouse on the upper left. They put these shelves in against the wall, which gives you some variation in, in uh, texture. Um, and they put things they obviously love, like a little birdhouse, a wreath, an angel. They put this cute little yellow bird up here. I assume he's gonna fly to that birdhouse, but I'm not sure. They, um, they put nice pillows. They put this cute flower sign. They have this little table that looks like an indoor table to me. They did this planter of flowers. They put a piece of corrugated metal on this wall um, to add, again, a different texture and a different color. Um, and then you need to remember flexibilities, gardens, have a funny way of telling you what they need, which isn't always what you were going to do. Um, so that might be the plant that doesn't want to grow there or the plant that really likes growing there or the hardscape that doesn't quite work or the thing you find at your neighbor's yard sale that will be perfect in that space. Be prepared to change ideas midstream. As you learn to look more critically at the world, you'll get new and different ideas that you might want to incorporate into your garden design. 
and keep a wish list of things you'd like to do in the garden, but seem un unobtainable now because the opportunity might present itself to complete the idea. We always wanted a stone path to our chicken coop, but we didn't have the money to buy the stone. Our neighbor was dismantling the fountain his house came with and he said we could have the rocks and now I have my stone path. Um, and if ideas aren't coming to you, have a friend or neighbor give you some thoughts, take a photo, you could reverse the photo, change it to black and white, stand in a different spot in your yard, rearrange things that are already there or empty the space and just sleep on it. Ideas come to us overnight, over weeks, you know, don't stress over it. There's not a deadline necessarily, unless you're having a wedding in your yard and then that's a different story. Um, the other day I had a lady at my house, she wanted to look at things um, to think about for making her pollinator garden. And she snapped a picture in my front yard from a place I would never think about taking a picture of my front yard. Totally different angle, line of sight, everything. And it was magnificent. And I never looked at the yard from that perspective. Um, other thoughts. Gardening here can be hard, hot, dry summers, cold and dry winters. So be realistic about what will grow here to avoid disappointment. Try to use California and Nevada natives and native emulators as much as possible. And to me, a native emulator is like a cultivated native. Um, so like there's creeping flocks and flocks is a native in the mountains, but they've cultivated and it works really well. I have cultivated California grape all over my yard um, because I can't go anywhere and steal cuttings from natural native grapes anymore because I don't live near them. But the cultivated one works fine. And try to consider dual purpose plantings. And what I mean by that is plants that do two things. If you need shade and it doesn't have to be a giant tree, you could use a fruit tree, which would give you or the birds or both something to eat. Um, if you plant trees um, and bushes, try to plant something that flowers to give pollinators food. And if you can make that a native, that's even better. And you might consider putting some vegetables in your border plantings for food and for beauty. Like onions make the most beautiful flowers and they look great in a perennial border. Let's see. And final steps, take time out during your construction to enjoy your space, add little details that make it your own, add something that's not obvious, but a little surprise. So we have lots of lizards in our yard and we have little metal lizards screwed into different spots on our patios. And when you're finished, have a party and celebrate and enjoy. So I hope that was helpful. Let's see. How do I unshare? Stop share. There we go. Roberta, that was fantastic. I loved that. Well, thank you. Okay. Kate and I have some similar items in our respective yards from the South Shore. <laughs> this is sort of funny. <laughs> Roberta, I'm going gonna... to garden beds and I use them for shade, but it's kind of funny. <laughs> I wanted to just quickly share this, Roberta. This was a picture, obviously, oh. this is from Roberta's garden. And I took this one day when I was there for inspiration. And it's one of my favorite photos. And every time I look at it, I think of Pete and Roberta, and I think of my time there. And um, it's just beautiful. It's just simply beautiful. And since then, I have bought some things and made a little similar place in my indoor. So I just wanted to share that of what well, inspiration. I appreciate, I appreciate that because that's a picture I should have included. Oh, because <laughs> um, that is one of my favorite areas. And we got that Buddha, it's painted red at the flea market in Stockton for like $5. And it's like two feet tall. Yeah. yeah. And, and I love that little area. So it's thank you for having that picture because that should have been in there. Well, I don't know about shit or not, but I just, I really wanted to share that it, um, how, I mean, your garden inspires us in lots of ways, but that's one small example of how it inspired me. Plus, you know, 
I took the ESLT job. So that was another inspiration. <laughs> and we're glad you did. Yeah, and we're glad you did. Um, but I think for us, the winter patio is a nice place that you could sit outside in the winter from about 10 to 2. Not every day, but a lot of times because it just bakes back there. It's not good in the summer, but. <laughs> So does anyone have any questions or anything like that? Well, I think, I think it was really very interesting. And one of the messages is well, we have to have a lot more patience than we have because it doesn't happen overnight. <laughs> it happens yeah, over years. It, it doesn't. I mean, I know for Pete and I, our whole backyard or front yard was lawn and that's just back breaking labor. And we've gotten stronger and smarter in the whole time we've lived here and how to accomplish some of that. And we had to move a lot of rainbows and all my rainbows are in the corners and they're submitted into the hardscape and, you know, all that's behind us now pretty much. So it's a little bit easier, but if you can be patient and have the long-term vision like I'm thinking of you making your planting beds with your redwood. I mean, you can make, you could put fun things on the corners as you bolt the sides together. I mean, oops, excuse me, my glasses are going away. I mean, there's a lot of fun things you can add to those, mm -hmm. those walls and, you know, maybe not right away. I mean, if you have access to horseshoes and you like horses, you just make a, a cute border of horseshoes yeah. on the edges. And there's a million things you can do. Um, and, you know, you want your beds done now so you can have your tomatoes in the ground for the summer. But you could be thinking about what would I really like these beds to look like? Maybe in the winter when they don't have stuff in them, maybe they're not as cute, you know. Because everything can be made to look cute or nice or, you know, whatever term you want to use. Right. So it looks good all year round. Um, and if you're going to do hoops, you know, so you can extend your growing season, then you can think about how to make those interesting. They still have those, those half circle rebar things at Browns and mm. they make great hoops. Yeah. Go. Shade cloth or frost cloth over for vegetable gardens. Mm -hmm. um, and we have them um, and, you know, we got these things at different times. So they weren't quite the right width, but we were able to bend them and make them work. So ourselves without any tools. I haven't made it out to Browns yet. And I think it could be a dangerous place. <laughs> um, the good thing about Browns is a lot of the stuff is too heavy for you to get into your car. <laughs> your truck. But boy, if you needed a steel beam, you know, to take out a wall in your house, they got them. Hmm. Um, so. But yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things you can do and you can put the painted side of your boards on the outside and have it look rustic. You know, a lot of fun things you can do. Roberta. Well, thank you, Roberta. Take your time, you know, making it pretty. Yeah. Yeah, that was very inspiring. I, I just want to comment and say that I really enjoyed the beginning where you just had pictures of things that weren't even gardens necessarily, but, but things that you pulled inspiration from, which I feel like is important to remember. Yeah, anything often. that you love. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, or eye, eye catching. Yeah, so that was a uh, that was a great presentation. I, that was, I, yeah, I enjoyed that. <laughs> better um, on the screen, you know, we can do this in person next year. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. Yes. Garden tour. Yeah. Well, um, I want to be mindful of folks' time. It's one, um, and just another huge thank you to Roberta. Um, and her expertise. <laughs> um, yeah, so if, if anyone is interested in the pollinator garden or even contacting um, or having a, any additional questions, just 
um, email me. I put my email in the chat. It's Gabrielle at ESLT.org once again. Um, and yeah, um, enjoy everyone. Enjoy your weekend. <laughs> thank you for coming. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you so for, much. Thank you. And thank you again, Roberta. That was very inspirational. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Bye guys. Bye.